Exodus chapter 33. We're going to continue from where we left off this morning. Exodus chapter 33. And the title of the message is Looking for Glory in 2017. Normally it would just be entitled Looking for Glory, but I want this to be more of a New Year's message and give us some challenges for the day and for the new year. We talked about this morning, how can we see the glory? Oh, we have to have His presence. Where's the glory found? First of all, it's found in a people inhabited. A people inhabited by the presence of Almighty God. The number one we, thing we need in our individual lives, in our families, in this church, in this nation, is the presence of God. That's the only thing that will make a difference. Amen? Amen. And we talked about all that, and I want to leave off, leave off from there. And we uh, completed our reading through verse 14, so we'll pick up our reading now in verse 15. Not only is the glory found in the people inhabited, but secondly, the glory is found in a people identified. In a people identified. Verse 15. And he said unto him, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not that in that thou goest with us? In other words, is it not that we're identified by you that we can do what you've called us to do? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Now, I have an interesting question here. What made Israel different from every other nation? Every other nation on earth had land. I know Israel was looking for land. God had promised them land. But that was no different from any other nation. Every nation under heaven had land. Amen? Amen? So that didn't differentiate Israel from everybody else. Was it armies? My goodness, no. Israel had armies, yes, and a powerful army. They had God on their side. But just having an army did not separate them from other nations. For other nations had armies. Hence the army of Egypt that trapped Israel across the Red Sea at least halfway. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Was it religion? No. Other <coughs> nations had religions. So that didn't separate uh, Israel from everyone else. Government. No. Other nations had government. In fact, there were quite possibly other nations who had a... Uh, uniquely form of government uh, before God set Israel down and said, okay, here's how government should run. You know, Israel was in kind of a mess, so other nations had it together uh, even before Israel did, as far as government goes. So that didn't separate them. Traditions. No. There were a number of nations that had traditions. That did not differentiate Israel from all other nations. So what made Israel special? What made Israel unique? What was the identifying object that made them a one of a kind, special, holy people? I build off of my first point. It was the presence of God. That's what identified them as a special people. The presence of God is what made them set apart. And if you want to be a different kind of people, listen, other people have jobs. Other people have spouses. Other people have children. Other people have problems that they go through. Other people have joy and laughter. Other people love their families and, and work hard. And, and all those things are great. And you can go through the whole human experience. But the one thing that will make you different, that will set you apart and make you a holy people is you are identified by the presence of God. Moses said, let 
this identify us. Amen. That we have you. Amen. And that's what will separate us. That's what will make us special. <coughs> I want you to notice something. After studying the book of Exodus a little bit, I have discovered that there are 58 questions asked in the entire book of Exodus. After verse 16, there are no more questions asked from God or from anyone else in all the rest of the book of Exodus. What are the last two questions in the book of Exodus? They're found in verse 16. Look. Moses asked, For wherein shall it be known here that I and my people have found grace in thy sight? That's the second to last question. And then the last question is, Is it not in that thou goest with us? That's the last question. In other words, Moses is asking, Is not the fact that you go with us, is that not enough? Is that not what will identify us and will separate us and show us apart from all the nations under heaven? What's the significance of that, Brother Josh? Well, I'm glad you asked. When God gives you His presence, there's nothing else you need. When you have God's presence, there's nothing else to ask. There's nothing else to ask for. There's no more doubt when, you, when you've when got the Creator of the universe right there. When you've got the one who can look at somebody who's been in the grave for three days and say, come on and live again. There's nothing else to ask. Amen. When you've got the one, Brother Ellen, you've got the one who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You don't have to ask where's the bread coming from, Paul. You don't have to ask where am I going to get work. When you've got the presence of God in your family, you don't have to ask anything else. The questions are all over. God says, hey, you've got me. You've got the answer. You daddies, you don't have to ask anymore how to be a daddy if you've got the presence of God in your life. The greatest daddy who ever lived, if you've got Him by your side, you're going to make it just fine. Amen. You, you, you women, you don't have to ask uh, how to be the greatest mother and how to be the greatest wife if you've got the one who said what being a wife is like, who wrote it down for you. If you've got His presence in your heart and by your side, the questions are all over. Amen. Church member, if you want to ask how to be the best church member you can be, well, you don't have to ask if you've got the presence of the one who founded the church, who started the church, who says what the church is. If you've got His presence, there's no more questions to ask. Amen. If you've got His presence, there's nothing else you need. Nothing else to wonder. And nothing else matters. Well, we see... <laughs> Trey, will you grab me some water, please? We see that the glory is found in people who are inhabited by the presence of God. It's found in the people who are identified by the presence of God. Thirdly, it's found in the people who are impassioned by the presence of God. In passion. Look at verse 17. Thank you, my brother. <clears throat> verse 17. Y'all excuse me. I'm trying here. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I do know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, Show me thy glory. <clears throat> now listen. <clears throat> you need to understand. Remember back in verse. <clears throat> verse 11. 
And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. Listen, Moses and God had already talked face to face like friends talk together. Moses had been up to the top of Mount Sinai fasted for, for 40 days and 40 nights and got the Ten Commandments, came back down, got mad about the golden calf, destroyed the golden calf, went back up to the top of the mountain, fasted 40 more days and 40 more nights. Most scholars believe that Moses never ate or drank anything for a whole 80 days and 80 nights where he talked with God and communed with God and God gave him the Ten Commandments. He had seen God. He had heard from God. But he asked God for something else. He doesn't <coughs> ask Him for anything that he's already gotten. He's asking Him for something that he had not received yet. And he was impassioned by it. He said, show me thy glory. God, I need something special from you. He had a passion in his heart. <clears throat> Let me say it this way. You cannot get in the presence of Almighty God and be a sad sack. You cannot be down in the dumps and get in the presence of God and stay down in the dumps. Jesus never met a lame man that He didn't make walk. Never met a blind man that He didn't make see. Never met a withered hand that He didn't make it go out straight. Never met a dumb person that He didn't make talk. Never met a, 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 a dead person that He didn't make alive again. And when He walked into a funeral, He broke it up, made them alive again. Put the undertaker out of business. Amen. And He never met a person that had sorrow that He didn't make smile. Will there be any tears in heaven? No. no. Will there be any boredom in heaven? No. Will there be any negativity at all? Or any somber tone in heaven? No. Why? What makes heaven so special? Heaven will have beautiful nature like we have here on earth. Heaven will have a stream of water, but we've seen streams of water. I went to the Bahamas this past week and I saw the beautiful blue water, bluer than I've ever seen. I had to tell this story. I was out in the, let me chase this rabbit, this will be funny. I was out in that blue water and all of a sudden uh, people started trying to jump out of the water. And I turned around and because the water was so clear and so beautiful, you could see for a good distance away. And I looked at a good distance away. I mean, probably uh, it was past the doors of the church. I mean, it was kind of on out there. But it kept getting closer. And the closer it got, the longer it got. And it wasn't like a shark or anything. It was a cylinder type shape. And it was swimming just like that. And the closer it got to me, I thought, my God in heaven, an anaconda's coming after me. <laughs> Y'all know how I am about snakes. I was out of that water. I was up there by the restaurant before the people could even get out of the water and they started leaving before I did. Everyone likes snakes. I turned around and you know what it was? It was an old rope off of something that had floated up but I could have swore it was a snake and it looked like it was coming for me. And I'm sure that the water in heaven will be crystal clear. Not a stain in it. Not a bit of mud. Beautiful water. But we can see that here. What makes heaven so special? 
God will be there face to face. And I shall see Him face to face and tell the story saved by grace. Face to face with Christ my Savior, I'll be able to touch Him. Hold Him. My faith will be sight. I'll, I'll grip Him. I won't have to leave Him. I don't get near as excited about that as I do. Amen. His presence is special. Amen. It's not something that we have all the time. We get into sin, we get in our doubts, we have our problems, and the least little thing makes us get into our pity party time or into our penalty box. <laughs> We have to admit that we're not in God's presence 24-7. But we know when we get there. And it changes our attitude. When we really come to worship, it changes us. You can't just sit back and go through the motions when you're really in the presence of God. That's why there's some people in church that come and they sit down. Somebody has a spell because they're in the presence of God. Somebody else sits over here, wonders what in the world are they doing because they're not in the same presence. Amen. You can't be in the presence of God and not be affected by it. Amen. It's impossible. It's going to do something to you. That's why Jesus said, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking, whatever is in here is going to come out there. It is a result of what happens when you have an encounter, when you have a head-on collision with Jesus. It, it must do something to you. If you can meet with the presence of God and be in the presence of Him doing something great, and it not... Bring a tear to your eye or a gleam in your face or a shout in your lips or a pep in your step. Something. If it doesn't do anything at all to you, I would check your salvation. Amen. It has to affect you. <coughs> the people could not get around Jesus without being moved, stirred, Interrupted. God's presence does something to us. It impassions us. Moses put his whole heart into this request. God, show me thy glory. And you need to understand something. Moses had an understanding of what this request could do to him. He knew that this request could very well take his earthly life. He knew that asking this, and if he looked upon the glory of God with these human eyes, it would kill him. For numerous times the Bible says, if anyone were to look upon God in that way, they'd be dead. Moses knew, yet he, he said, you mean more to me than my own life. Having you with me means more to me than my own life. And if I've got to die for it, I want you. I need you. You can't tell me that he didn't have a heart full of passion. Amen. And if we had more passion like that, we'd see revival. Amen. And finally, Not only is glory found in a people inhabited by the presence of God, in a people identified by the presence of God, in a people impassioned by the presence of God, but finally a people immune because of the presence of God. Verse 19. 
I'm sorry, verse 17. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Now again, there are 44 appearances of God in the Scripture. What made this particular appearance any different than all the others? What made this unique? There are 44 other ones, and none of them seem as special as this. Why? Let's examine a few things. First of all, I want you to notice the wording that God uses. In verse 19, And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. Why did He use this word goodness for His glory? Well, this word goodness is a word that is a re reference to the justice of God. I want you to know that God has a perfect standard. For example, let's take one of the Ten Commandments. We might say, hey, well, all I've ever done is I told a little white lie. But when you hold that little white lie up to God's perfect standard, that little white lie makes you a liar. Amen. Look, the only thing I can remember stealing in my life was a little three-cent piece of gum. But that little three-cent piece of gum makes me a thief in the eyes of God. God has a perfect standard of justice. Amen? Amen? And His perfect standard, no one can live up to it. No one can be, look it in the face and say, I have been good enough to obtain stability in your form of justice. And so God says, there is none that doeth good. No, not one. There is none righteous, no, not one. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's all of us. So what he was saying here is, Moses, you're a sinner. You've broken my law. And you've broken my heart. You and all the people of Israel have sinned against me. And you are not worthy of me. But you can see me nonetheless. Because I'm going to, get ready for it. You ready church? I'm going to make a way for it to happen. <laughs> even though you're not worthy. <laughs> even though that you deserve to never see me. To never see my glory. To die and go to hell. I'm going to make a way for you to see my glory. I'm going to make a way for me to commune with you. I'm going to make a way. <laughs> Only salvation can protect someone from the righteous justice of an almighty God. How's that shown here? Well, I want you to notice something else. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Now notice that. Did Moses know about Jesus or did he not? Yes. I believe, look, I've never seen this. And this got my fire blazed up. God said, I'm going to tell you where salvation is found. I'm going to proclaim to you the name of the Lord. What is the name of the Lord? And you might say, some, some people might say, well, this is the Old Testament, so this must be talking about Yahweh. 
No, I'll show you. Well, this must be talking about Jehovah. No, I'll show you. Well, this must be talking about Adonai or Abba. No, I'm going to show you. What does the Bible say in the New Testament? For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. You missed it. Let me say that again. For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. Is that what it says? No. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What is that name that we must call on? Where is salvation found in? Jesus. For there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Amen. And so God is saying here, I'm going to tell you about my son, Jesus. And I'm about to put a picture here of what's going to happen to you in the future when I save your soul and record your name forever in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen, Moses. I'm going to put you in this, in this rock. By the way, Jesus said, upon this rock, <laughs> I'll build my church. The psalmist said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. The only way that we can be saved is through the rock, through the foundation. Paul said, no man can build upon this foundation. I mean, no man can lay another foundation than that which is laid. Now, you can build upon the foundation, but no other foundation can be laid than that is laid. And that is the foundation of Jesus Christ. He is the rock. He is the cornerstone of the church. He is salvation on foot. Amen. Without Him, you can't be saved. You say, well, if I call upon God the Father alone, I, I don't have to have Jesus. I, I just need God the Father. Hey, listen, you can't get to God the Father without Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He's the only way. Jesus is not a good way to heaven. He's not the best way to heaven. He is the only way to heaven. And the only way you'll be saved is by calling on His name. Amen. And so God here says, Moses, I'm not going to let you see my face. You're not ready yet. But one day you'll be ready after Jesus has completed what He's going to do. But what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to show you a picture of what He's going to do. So I'm going to have my goodness, my justice pass before you. And you won't be able to see my face. But you're going to get a glimpse of the glory as it passes by you. How are you going to do that? Well, first... I'm going to put you in a rock. And I'm going to cover you with my hand. And both the rock and the hand of God are pictures of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the rock upon which salvation is founded. And the hand of God. Who is called the right hand of God? Jesus. And He says... And it shall come to pass while my glory passes by, I will put thee in a cleft of the rock and I will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. It's the same picture like Moses had already seen in Egypt when the death angel passed by. Only the blood of the lamb that was on the doorpost saved them and allowed them to live. Well, if Moses had not been in the rock and covered by the hand. He wouldn't have lived. Amen. But because he was in the rock and covered by the hand of God, he was immune from the justice that was coming by, from the goodness that passed by. And I want you to know, I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We've broken the law of God. And one day we'll stand before the God of heaven and the only way that we're going to live from that day in seeing Him face to face is by being in the rock <laughs> and being covered by the hand. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Did Moses know who Jesus was? Yes. Yeah. Because the only name of the Lord that would be proclaimed in reference to salvation is Jesus. Amen. Whosoever shall call upon that name shall be saved. If you're here and you don't know whether you're saved or not, you don't know whether you're going to heaven or not, trust Christ. Let this be a brand new year for you. Let Jesus make a difference in you. And I promise you, you'll see glory. Church, if we are inhabited by the presence of God, Miss Jean, come on. If we are identified by the presence of God, and we are impassioned by the presence of God, people won't want anymore what's out there. They'll want God's presence if they see you with God's presence. If they see the results of what God's presence brings to His people. I've never seen anybody that looked at my life and saw what God has done and said, I don't want that. They may say, I don't believe that. But you'll never hear them say, I don't want that. Amen. You may hear an atheist say, and I have atheist friends. And I'll, I'll quote one of my atheist friends. One of my atheist friends said this, Josh, I don't believe anything you believe. But I sure wish I had the peace you had. Amen. I've heard all of them say, I don't believe in what you got. But I've never heard them say, I don't want what you got. Amen. And the only reason that our churches are closing around this nation and that more people aren't coming right here is because they haven't seen it. What God's presence can do to His people. But we can change that. Amen. We can show people what it's like to be in God's presence. Amen. And we'll be a different people. And when we're in the presence of God, church will never be boring. Amen. Psalms will never be hard to sing. Smiles won't be hard to bring. Some of you might even shout a little bit and have a spell like your pastor. <laughs> you want to get, get a glimpse of heaven. Get some of the glory restored back in our lives. Make His presence our ultimate goal. God, nothing else matters if we don't have You. I won't go anywhere, Lord, without your presence. That's what we need for 2017. That's what you need for your family. That's what you need for your life. That's what we need in this country. But it needs to start right here at the church. We need this church full of God's presence and glory. That's where the glory is at. Will you ask Him for it? Will you be like the Old Testament prophet who wrestled with God and wouldn't let Him go. He even got a broke rib because He wouldn't turn Him loose. I'm not letting you go, Lord, until you give me what I want. What did He want? I want you. You may be here and you may have doubts sometimes. Some of the greatest people in the Bible doubted. Peter doubted. May I get honest with you? I've doubted some things sometimes. Sometimes I've asked God, God, where are you at in this? What are you doing? And God has to slap me around a little bit and say, hey, I ain't the one that moved away. You are. You are. And I have to say, God, I want the glory back. 
And I get on my knees. And I grab on to Him. And I say, God, I need You to make it real. Make it real to me. Make it real. And I'm not leaving until I get You. 